Hi, welcome to Living Life. I'm so thankful that you can join us as we study the Word of God together. You know, just recently I came back from a family reunion and I haven't been able to see my parents for a few years now uh, due to COVID. And I got a chance to talk to my brother and we coordinated so that we would all meet together uh, under one roof. So it was a very special occasion as we got a chance to sit down, talk, and laugh, and reminisce uh, about the past. And as we were spending time, I, I realized that uh, talking to my parents and talking to my brother, I saw just how different we really are. Uh, we're very different in how we look, uh, how we act, how we think. And we even had a disagreement uh, while we were together during that time. And as we are looking in Genesis here in chapter 36, we're going to be looking at two brothers and how vastly different they are as well. Uh, not just physically, uh, but one of the most important things that they differ in is how they were spiritually. And that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at as we discuss and dissect um, into the lives of, of Esau and his brother. But Esau specifically as we'll be looking into his life and how God formed him and how he's going to use his life uh, that he thinks is best. And that's what we're going to be looking at as we dive into uh, chapter 6 and seeing his lineage and seeing his background and seeing the things that God has done for him uh, in this time period. So let's get ready to look at chapter 36. Genesis chapter 36, verses 1 through 43. This is the account of the family line of Esau, that is, Edom. Esau took his wives from the women of Canaan, Ada, daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Oholibamah, daughter of Ana, and granddaughter of Zibion the Hivite, also Basimith, daughter of Ishmael, and sister of Nebaioth. Ada bore Eliphaz to Esau, Basimith bore Ruel, and Oholibamah bore Jush, Jalam, and Korah. These were the sons of Esau, who were born to him in Canaan. Esau took his wives and sons and daughters and all the members of his household, as well as his livestock and all his other animals and all the goods he acquired in Canaan, and moved to a land some distance from his brother Jacob. Their possessions were too great for them to remain together. The land where they were staying could not support them both because of their livestock. So Esau, that is Edom, settled in the hill country of Seir. This is the account of the family line of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Esau's wife Ada, and Ruel, the son of Esau's wife Basmith. The sons of Eliphaz, Taman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Esau's son Eliphaz also had a concubine named Timnah, who bore him Amalek. These were the grandsons of Esau's wife Ada, the sons of Ruel, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These were the grandsons of Esau's wife Basimith. The sons of Esau's wife Oholibamah, daughter of Ana, and granddaughter of Zibion, whom she bore to Esau, Jush, Jalam, and Korah. These were the chiefs among Esau's descendants, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, chiefs Temin, Omar, Zepho, Kenaz, Korah, Gatam, and Amalek. These were the chiefs descended from Eliphaz and Edom. They were grandsons of Ada, the sons of Esau's son Ruel, chiefs Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These were the chiefs descended from Ruel and Edom. They were grandsons of Esau's wife Basimith, the sons of Esau's wife Oholibamah, chiefs Jush, Jalam, and Korah. These were the chiefs descended from Esau's wife Oholibamah, daughter of Ana. These were the sons of Esau, that is, Edom, and these were their chiefs. These were the sons of Ser the Horite, who were living in the region. Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Ana, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishon. The sons of Ser and Edom were Horite chiefs. The sons of Lotan, 
Hori, and Haman. Timna was Lotan's sister. The sons of Shobal, Alvin, Manahath, Ebal, Shepho, and Onam. The sons of Zibion, Aya, and Ana. This is the Ana who discovered the hot springs in the desert while he was grazing the donkeys of his father Zibion. The children of Ana, Deshon and Oholibama, daughter of Ana. The sons of Deshon, Hemdin, Eshbin, Ithrin, and Kirin. The sons of Ezer, Bilin, Zavin, and Akan. The sons of Deshon, Uz and Aran. These were the Horite chiefs, Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Ana, Deshon, Ezer, and Deshon. These were the Horite chiefs according to their divisions in the land of Seir. These were the kings who reigned in Edom before any Israelite king reigned. Bela, son of Beer, became king of Edom. His city was named Dinaba. When Bela died, Jobab, son of Zerah, from Bozrah, succeeded him as king. When Jobab died, Husham from the land of the Temanites succeeded him as king. When Husham died, Hadad, son of Badad, who defeated Midian in the country of Moab, succeeded him as king. His city was named Avith. When Hadad died, Samla from Mazurka succeeded him as king. When Samla died, Shal from Rehoboth on the river succeeded him as king. When Shal died, Baal Hanan, son of Akbor, succeeded him as king. When Baal Hanan, son of Akbor, died, Hadad succeeded him as king. His city was named Pau, and his wife's name was Mehetabel, daughter of Matred, the daughter of Mezahab. These were the chiefs descended from Esau, by name, according to their clans and regions Timna, Alva, Jetheth, Oholibama, Elah, Pinan, Kanaz, Taman, Mibzar, Magdiel and Iram. These were the chiefs of Edom, according to their settlements in the land they occupied. This is the family line of Esau, the father of the Edomites. You know, I really enjoy the book of Genesis, and it's filled with a lot of drama. Uh, we see that it has so much history, and not only looking back, but also how it pertains to us now and into the future. And chapter 6 gives us a snapshot into the life of Esau, and he is an important part of the history of Genesis and the lineage leading up to Jesus Christ. Uh, he, is, he is a twin brother, and uh, his twin brother is Jacob. And Esau was the older one, and he was one who was hairy, and he was known because he was a hunter. And he uh, would, you know, get his own food and hunt game, and he would cook it for his bro for his for his father. And at this scene, we hear about how uh, Rachel and Isaac, his parents, had passed away. And now the the uh, camera turns towards the children in seeing how they will live their lives and how they will live for God or not. Uh, and so one of the things that we look at in, in Esau that you notice here is that there is a lack of spiritual concern in, in his life. So uh, from the very beginning, uh, we'll always remember Esau as the one who gave up his birthright. And he did it out of selfish reason, out of the physical need for food was more important to him than having the birthright that would be carried on for the rest of his life. And so he was all about satisfying that physical hunger that he was experiencing that he thought was more important. And so therefore it says that he despised his birthright. Uh, and also that what we see here in this passage is that Esau did not listen to the godly advice that his grandfather gave, telling his, uh, his servant uh, so that Isaac would not marry a Canaanite woman because they were not part of the history, the same spiritual background as the Israelites. Um, Esau did not think that it was important, and he married women who were from Canaan. And so when we look at Esau, we see someone who is strong, someone who is independent, uh, who is athletic, 
uh, who's everything that you know we would look up to by the world's standards. Uh, and he was able to cope with problems through his own resources. He was able to overcome them by what he thought was right. Uh, so, but in his life, we don't see him turning to God uh, in, uh, that's ever been brought to our attention. Uh, the author never shows us that uh, whether if he faced difficulties and if it was used for him to turn to seek God. But uh, when you look in Genesis, you'll see how Abraham, uh, we'll see how, how Jacob, how Isaac, they all struggled to have children and therefore they cried out to God. Uh, Esau never had that problem. Uh, he had children and he had many of them uh, that would be become his inheritance. Uh, so we see that for his, his others, his father, his grandfather, even his brother, that they had these painful moments. But those were important lessons that they learned to trust and to seek God. Uh, we don't see any of that happening in the life of Esau. And so when you look and read about uh, Esau's family, it sounds very impressive. Now uh, you read of all the different uh, sons that he has carrying on from generation to generation. And if you look closely, uh, they are described as chiefs and as kings. And it's very impressive to see that, uh, that there were so many of royalty that were born out of the line of Esau. But even though this may all look good in the eyes of the world, but what we see later on is that they were always fighting against the Israelites. And I think that this was a lack of, of spiritual understanding from Esau that he was not able to accept and he did not carry that pass down unto his children and the future generations. And so that was a big problem, I believe, in his life. Though he may have been rich in the worldly sense, uh, we see that he was poor spiritually and not listening and living the ways uh, of the Lord, but rather he was living for himself. And so that's something that we have to be aware of, that we impart unto our children, uh, not the worldly success. We don't want them to be athletic or popular or wealthy or successful, but we need to teach them to be faithful and obedient to God and God alone. And so, as followers of Christ, we need to make our children disciples. We may have to have them understand who Christ is from an early age so that they can follow Him and that they can be the future generation of faith that we can pass on uh, from the next and, on, and onwards. And so, remember, uh, worldly success does not always equate to spiritual success. That even though he, uh, his lineage may look impressive uh, by the world, but we see that uh, he was lacking was a fear of God. And so as you read and look at this chapter, let's be reminded who our king is and who our God that we need to follow all the days of our lives. You know, when you look at Esau's life, uh, you have to think, what was he known for? And a lot of people may refer back to as he was the one who foolishly gave up his birthright just for an exchange for a meal. But more than that, I think it gives us uh, a little bit of insight into his life that uh, he was all about uh, feeding his flesh about making sure that he is satisfied in a sense physically and not spiritually. So I think that is the biggest difference um, that we see in Esau. And we see that being carried out uh, in the future uh, for his children and the, and the following generation, that we don't see the, the passing of the spiritual identity or the spiritual knowledge or the faith that's being passed on to generations. And that's something that needs to be brought to our attention as well. That if we don't learn to stop, if we don't learn to pause and reflect and see what we are doing, how we are influencing um, our children, 
uh, that we can easily fall into uh, the same habit that Esau was falling into. And so may we learn to take a step back and may we see um, our, and ask ourselves, are we really following God and are we teaching our children, teaching people who are younger than us to follow in the ways of the Lord? Uh, so let's devote ourselves to doing that through prayer. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, we thank you for this passage. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, that we want to live according to your standards. And we pray, God, that your word will dwell in us richly and help us, God, to uh, fight against the, the desires of this world and to make you known, God, through our lives. We love you and we thank you and we offer ourselves up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.